I've had a few close encounters with the supernatural in my role as Giles on Buffer the Vampire Slayer. Of course, that was just fiction. But it has made me curious about the realities that lie behind the horror stories we all know. So I'm about to embark on a journey into the darkest reaches of our imagination to uncover the truth behind one of the best-known figures in the history of the supernatural, one that has been reviled and persecuted. Could such a figure be capable, even today, of perpetrating true horror? I'm going in search of witches. Every fairy story seems to have a witch in it somewhere. Children through the ages have been frightened by cackling hags, riding broomsticks, ready to wave a wand, weave a spell, transform them into a toad. 300 years ago, people were so fearful of witchcraft that thousands of women, men and children were tried as witches and burned at the stake. That was then. What about now? If you wanted to find a modern witch, then you could do far worse than come to this conference centre in Croydon, South London. I'm visiting the largest gathering of witches in the world. Witch Fest International 2004 programme. What have we got? Making your magic work better. Wand making workshop. Anatomy of a spell. I think I'm in the right place. Four thousand witches have gathered here to talk shop. We're going to the kitchen, witch. And it's also their chance to buy anything a modern witch could want. You've got to buy your witch's hat and ram's horn somewhere. I just wasn't expecting everything and everyone to be so charming. And for those who want to decorate their wand, here's a class that would be at home at Hogwarts. I made my first wand when I was 14 years old and I got my dad to take me out to the woods and I said, that's the one, and I talked to the tree and asked it and he clambered up and got me my wand for me. <laughs> it's a physical extension of your, of your will, your power, your finger. This is, your, this is like saying a great big to the world, this is my finger, this is my magic finger. <laughs> Maybe it seems like a giant trade show, but these people aren't just in it for the pointy hats. There are serious practitioners here, priests and priestesses of the religion that witchcraft has become. But it seems so cleaned up that it's almost a relief to discover that spells and potions still have a place. Do you do potions or spells or anything? Yeah, of course do? we do. Yeah. <laughs> We're witches. <laughs> We do. You know, potions and spells is something that's often kind of like considered as kind of slightly weird or slightly, you know, dark, if you like. But they can be done for positive purposes as well. Spells aren't done just for the sake of them. They take a lot of preparation, they take a lot of work. If we were to do spells every day, we'd be kind of knackered. <laughs> Although the witchcraft practiced here has turned its back on the dark side, throughout history, there's always been an association with evil. And it's one that hasn't gone away. On the morning of the 21st of September, 2001, here on this beach, the Thames River Police made an extremely disturbing discovery, one that would eventually provide evidence of witchcraft in its most murderous form being practiced right here in the heart of London. A murder investigation is underway after the dismembered body of a boy was found in the River Thames. The child's body was recovered from the water near the Globe Theatre in London. Detectives say he was about five and a half years old. Detective Chief Inspector Will O'Reilly was put in charge of the case. At first he thought he was dealing with an isolated child murder. Horrific, but just another statistic. Soon, he had to come to terms with something that was almost unimaginably much worse. At that stage, um, we had conducted our first post-mortem on the child, and it was the pathologist that raised concerns that um, this could be, in fact, a ritualistic murder. It was something... It, the injuries were something he's never seen before, mm. and he said the body had been drained of all blood, um, and that started to raise, um, raise our awareness in a subject, really, that none of us had considered before. When we first sought publicity on this, the members of the public said, look, we've heard about some uh, ritual murders that happen in South Africa called Mooty murders. Could it be a Mooty murder in, in London? Where did your investigation lead you? Um, our inquiries in this clearly pointed towards Africa, and, and it's to there that we went to, 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 for assistance in this crime. 
However witchcraft is presented here at home, this case has proved to me that today, in the world at large, something far more terrifying is practiced in its name. If I'm to get to the heart of this darkest form of witchcraft, it looks as if I'm going to have to search as far afield as Africa, where the fear of witches is just as real as it was for Europeans hundreds of years ago. <laughs> but first, I need to go back to the 16th century, when it said that the fate of kings and their kingdoms lay in the hands of witches. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, moor and gulf, of the rabbin sea salt shark, root of hemlock, picked in the dark. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. One of the most popular images we have of witches must come from Shakespeare's great play, Macbeth. But where does his image of witches come from? And is there any more to it than just some wonderfully scary storytelling? Trouble, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Peter Craze is the director of the drama studio London. He's taught generations of students how witchcraft was portrayed in a play that was first performed over 300 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Focus on, on, on the intention of the witches, which is to wreak havoc with Macbeth's life. Okay. Literally next to the Globe Theatre, you've got bear baiting in the bear garden, mm. the, the noise of the bears being torn apart and the dogs being torn apart, you know, drowning out the actors sometimes. And then across the river at the tower, you've got um, beheadings and executions and heads on spikes with blood running down and all the rest of it, and, and then traitors being hung, drawn and quartered. Mm. Where would you say this image of, of witches as, as hags and crones comes from? Shakespeare would have seen, he might even have actually attended witch trials. So he'd actually know very thoroughly what they looked like. And then when he came to translating it onto the stage, by putting it in, into the wonderful wilds of Scotland, he really kind of had a, a licence to go as far as he wanted with it. What would seeing witches on stage have meant to his, to his audience? Well, I think they'd have been quite terrified of them. And it's alleged there are actually witchcraft charms in the incantations of the witches in Macbeth. And the reason, one of the reasons that he was so accurate um, was because he was actually writing it for royalty. He was actually writing it for James VI of Scotland, who became James I. Um, and, and James was very, very involved in, in witchcraft, in fact, almost fanatical about it. So it seems that the key figure who shaped our modern understanding of witchcraft lived at the very top of 16th century society. I'm told that here at Lambeth Palace, there's a record of James VI's first encounter with a witch. I'm here to meet Professor Ronald Hutton, who specialises in the history of witchcraft. This book is a sexed-up government dossier. It's the official record, and you can see it just inside the title page. I have undertaken to publish this short treatise, which declareth the true discourse of all that happened, and as well what was pretended by those wicked and detestable witches against the king's majesty, as also by what means they wrought the same. The events described here are taking place in the villages and small towns to the east of Edinburgh towards the end of 1590. And that's where he focused on the greatest healer of the area, a woman called Agnes Sampson. And right so, the nails sayer that nailed Jesus and the mayor. Come on, lass. Come on. The whole thing about a charm is that words carry particular power. So it can be absolute gobbledygook, which nobody can understand, so it sounds really amazing. Or it can be a traditional evocation of Christian faith, and that's what poor old Agnes dealt with. In the earth and in the stone, I conjure thee in God's name. It was a bit tacky to the smooth new style of Protestant, but there was nothing inherently illegal about it, let alone diabolical. I trow by almighty God that rot both heaven and earth. Meanwhile, while poor old Agnes was busy healing people, little did she know that a few miles away another woman was in trouble. This was a mixed-up teenager called Gillis Duncan, who was a maidservant, who acquired a considerable healing skill. Her master had her tortured when the poor lassie went and said she'd given her soul and body to the devil, and she began to name other women in the neighbourhood as bigger and better witches than herself. Agnes Samson. You can see it here in the story. 
where immediately she accused these persons following to be notorious witches and calls them forthwith to be apprehended, viz. Agnes Sampson, the eldest witch of them dwelling at Haddington. And so it goes on and on and on, naming these unfortunates. The author of this book is almost certainly a minister from the area in which the witches had lived, called James Carmichael, and he managed to get the king interested in taking up the trial personally of a group of hitherto harmless healers and tying them into a huge diabolic plot by Satan himself to kill the king. We are, of course, delighted at you and your new bride's safe homecoming. Aye, uh, it was difficult for her. It seemed as though the storms would never abate. Did the tempest show itself out of ordinary fears? Perhaps, for the time of year. I fear they may be brought together infernally. In Haddington, we have a whole coven of witches that we believe intend harm against your majesty's person. No more of your witches. Sir, it is the devil himself would harm you. So you have her for me to see? If I may presume, uh, there can be none more fitted to extract the truth from her. This far she denies her guilt. But we have, from a serving lassie, an account of all the perverse prayers she used to cure the lady called Babberton. In Christ's name, I conjure thee. This aforesaid Agnes Sampson was taken and brought unto Holyrood House before the King's Majesty and sundry other of the nobility of Scotland where she was straightly examined. Straightly means strictly, rigorously. Look at me! You did say these things, did you not? These are your words. By Christ's name. What did you conjure? Answer me! Take her away. James is a really unusual monarch in that he is a genuine intellectual and what's more, he carries out research in his own right. And having thus turned himself into an expert witch hunter in theory, he applies the practice. And the story takes an extraordinary twist. He doesn't just become a royal judge, he becomes a royal torturer. You still have no results? Not yet, Your Majesty. Apply the screws more. It'll bring the devil to our tongue. Carmichael, you can leave it to me. What does the devil choose to mark you there? What the king is looking for here. is the witch's mark. It hath lately been found that the devil doth generally mark them with a privy mark, lick them with his tongue in some privy part of their body before he doth receive them to be his servants. You see, Carmichael, there is no need for shyness in these matters. The king found a privy mark of the devil somewhere in her crotch. It could be poor old Agnes had a hemorrhoid. At any rate, the result is decisive because at that moment she breaks. She realizes that now she's doomed. 200 witches we traveled to the sea. Where? North Berwick. And we were dancing. Aye, come where you go, over here. Come where you go, Listen me. up. Come where you go, me. Come. Oh, come where you go, here. Come. Come. Ah. Then the devil came to your kirk and he lifted up his gown and we all kissed his arse, every one of us. And he did say the most ungodly exhortations against his greatest enemy and his reason that the king of Scotland 
was his greatest enemy in the world. You're a liar, woman. At this point, Agnes is being disbelieved by the king, and she seems to lose her temper. And what follows is one of the most incredible moments in the entire history of witchcraft. I wish that you did not disbelieve my words, for I know. I know what you said to your queen on your wedding night. It is proved. It is logically possible that Agnes Sampson was a witch, but in which case she was absolutely brilliant at magic and absolutely terrible at survival skills. Dying as she does, Agnes becomes a grim statistic. She's one of about 1,100 people put to death for the alleged crime of witchcraft in Scotland. Agnes was relatively lucky as convicted witches go. She was strangled and then her body was burned to ashes. At least they choked her before she burned, so she was spared a horrific agony. James goes straight on from this experience to become one of the key European authors on witchcraft, a boffin. He publishes a book called Demonology, which by the standards of his time is actually very good in the sense that it's short, it's easily read by anybody, and it's a marvellously concise and clear way of explaining why you should believe in witches and how you should exterminate them. It became a bestseller. And if you want to see a copy, you just go a few miles north from where we are now to the British Library. Showing me an original edition of King James's Demonology is Cambridge history professor Malcolm Gaskell. Malcolm. Hi. How are you doing? Please drink. This is it then. This is the Demonology, yes. James I's famous book about witches. Wow. Who does he say the witches are? He asks the question, what can be the cause that there are 20 women given to that craft where there is but one man? The reason is easy, for as that sex is frailer than men, so it is easy to be entrapped in these gross snares of the devil. What James is saying is that women are morally frailer, therefore they're more likely to give in to the temptations of the devil, just as Eve did in the Garden of Eden. And what does he suggest you do with a witch if you think you've found one? He says in no uncertain terms, they ought to be put to death according to the law of God, the civil and imperial law, and municipal law of all Christian nations. So he's saying here that this is the worst kind of religious crime and therefore that suspects must be put through the process of trials and if found guilty in the courts, then they must be executed in every instance. Over a period of 300 years, 40 to 50,000 witches were killed as a result of the Witchcraft Act. I wanted to know from Malcolm, what's happened to our belief in witches since then? Well, the belief in witches persists amongst most ordinary people, but the problem is that by the end of the 17th century, the courts will no longer take seriously the kind of evidence that was once used to convict. So when was the last time the Witchcraft Act was, was used? It was in 1944. 1944? Uh, who was the unfortunate victim? This was the trial of a spiritualist medium called Helen Duncan. Why was she tried? She was tried because she purported to conjure up the spirits of the dead, N not just the voices of the dead, but actually the physical forms. Helen Duncan was a materialisation medium, which is really the holy grail of spiritualist gifts and skills. It is helpful to have jolliness, yes, if we'd all sat completely silent. It's very unconducive to anything happening at all, rather like a one-sided conversation. You want a bit of cut and thrust and mm, roll it in, yes. She would sit in a closed-off cabinet area, which just a curtain across a corner of a room, and there she claimed to build up energy known as ectoplasm, which then would come from her body. The ectoplasm fell almost like a white, a very heavy white mist onto the floor, and then suddenly, those would refine into identifiable features. And the, the very first spirit to appear at the beginning of every seance was Helen Duncan's spirit guide, who was known as Albert. 
Good evening, Albert. There's an old gentleman standing beside me that hurt his foot when he was a young lad. But then it would sort of shift from this kind of levity and comedy to, to pathos and, and sadness and tragedy as well. In wartime, a lot of people went to seances to try and find out what had happened to their loved ones. There's something else I have to tell you. A great British battleship has been sunk, the HMS Barham. She predicts, supposedly, that HMS Barham is sunk, which is a big British battleship on which almost 1,000 men are lost. see bodies on the water. In wartime, see. protecting information about shipping is, of course, an absolutely key it's concern, really and that this is perhaps really what gets the authorities onto her. There's a seance in January 1944 where a young naval officer called Stanley Worth attends. Now, he's appalled what he thinks there. It is just a, a conjuring show that people are actually being deceived and that their grief is being exploited for financial gain. And Stanley Worth jumps up, declares the whole thing a fraud, tries to grab hold of the spirit, grapples with the spirit, supposedly, but immediately senses that actually it's just a piece of cloth. When it came to charging Duncan, the authorities tried to ensure a conviction by dusting off an act that had been passed 200 years earlier. Contrary to Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act of 1735, are you guilty or not guilty? No guilty. Be seated, please. The Witchcraft Act means, really, that Helen Duncan can't ever be innocent because the Witchcraft Act says that it is illegal to attempt to conjure spirits. On the prosecution really side, there are very few witnesses, really, but you only really need one, yes. and that is Stanley Worth. Before Cross leapt up, did anything come out between the curtains of the cabinet? Yes, the white shrouded figure stood there between the curtains. Then what happened? He grasped the figure and held it, and I produced my torch and shone it on the scene and saw Mrs Duncan trying to get rid of a piece of white material that she was trying to throw down to the floor. And what... What sort of material was it? It looked like flimsy cloth, as a matter of fact. And as I went forward to assist Cross, someone knocked down my torch. As I brought it back to the scene, somebody pulled the cloth into the audience out of Cross's hand, who was trying to grasp it. What happened after that? Well, I saw Mrs Duncan standing there in her bare feet, bending down, trying to put her shoes on. She was not in a trance. And soon after that, she started screaming and yelling that she was ill and wanted a doctor. And there was quite a pandemonium at the time. If you thought Mrs Duncan was creating illusions in some way or another, had you a theory as to the method used by her for the purpose of perpetrating this fraud? Well, I could think of several ways, sir. Could you think of anything else other than Mrs Duncan playing bogey bogey with the sheet over her head? That is what you really thought, is it not? Something along those lines, sir. Could you think of anything else? I think that Lowsby, the defence barrister, I think he thinks he's doing rather well because well, he's persuading the court, he thinks, that Mrs sure. Duncan is absolutely I'm genuine absolutely and this will get her off. Mrs Duncan playing bogey-bogey with a sheet over her head? Yes, sir. That and no more? No, oh, that is all. Members of the jury, do you find the prisoner, Helen Duncan, guilty or not guilty for conspiracy to contravene the Witchcraft Act? Guilty, sir. <laughs> she breaks down the court and she says, I've, I've never heard so many lies in my life, and she's, she's taken down. The judge sentences to nine months, um, of which she's set to, to serve six. In 1951, the Witchcraft Act was repealed. But witchcraft didn't die with Britain's last witch. Remember the story of the Torso in the Thames? To explore the darkest reaches of modern witchcraft, I'm going to have to follow a trail back to the beginning of that horrific case. Back to a continent where witchcraft is rampant and sometimes terrifying. I'm going to travel to one of the darkest regions of the world, into the mines of the Muti murderers of Africa. <laughs> The 
this seems like a million miles away from the sort of place I'd expect to come to investigate the meaning of witchcraft today. Well, I'm just looking at the newspaper now. It confirms I'm in the right place. Check this out. Six men appear in Soweto court after witchcraft murder. A body was found at the beginning of the month. He had apparently been shot in the head several times before his chest was ripped open and heart, lungs and intestines torn out and genitals cut away. That's why when the Met Police discovered the torso in the Thames, they came here to Pretoria in South Africa to talk to the most unusual police unit in the world, one designed solely to investigate crimes of the occult. In the suburbs of Pretoria lives the man who founded that unit. He has first-hand experience of the horrors for which witchcraft is responsible. Dr. Kerbis Jonker. Yes. Pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. Can I call Please. you Kerbis? Yeah. Kerbis Jonker has devoted the past 20 years of his life to tracking down crimes associated with witchcraft. He began investigating what appeared to be simple murders, but it didn't take long to realize that the practice of witchcraft was behind some of his more gruesome discoveries. What evidence have you seen that, that witchcraft is real and present in Africa today? I know many people don't believe in witchcraft, our white folk especially. Mm. But I can assure you that witchcraft is a reality. To give you an example, we stopped a bus in KwaZulu Natal, in Durban, just outside of Durban. And a guy got out of the bus and he had a, he had a bag, plastic bag in his right hand. So when I said, no, I want to see what's in this bag, he was just normal, the guy. He wasn't even, he didn't even have nerves at that time. So it was his uh, sister's son's head in there, of 12 years old. He chopped off his nephew's head. One section of our black communities where black witchcraft plays a role, where we have to use uh, human remains or parts for medicine purposes, for, for putting, for example, putting a, placing a curse on someone. We have to use human parts for doing that. When the guys from the, the Met came here with their pictures of the the torso from the Thames. What alerted you to the fact that it might be witchcraft? I would say if you look at, at, at the wounds of the body, that's what I usually would look at first. Um, the, the way, the clean cut of the body parts and the way it's been cut showed and pointed towards that this was a medicine muti, muti killing. What is muti? Muti is, is uh, another name describing medicine or a concoction of medicine that's been mixed up with some sort of herb. If I want to find out more about Muti, where should I go? I think uh, your best place would be uh, on, on, on the Muti market down in KwaZulu Natal in Durban area. After hearing what I have about the darker side of witchcraft on this continent, I must admit I'm a little nervous about what I might find here at this booty market. But I'm going to meet Dr. Mflongo, who's the president of the Traditional Healers Council. He's going to show me around. In 16th century Scotland, Agnes Sampson, the healer who died as a witch, had her own herbs and potions. But she could only dream of a place like this. Hidden amongst the Durban tower blocks and flyovers, I've been told that this is the place where traditional African healers, or Sangomas, like Dr. Mshlongo, come to buy their magic potions. Dr. Mshlongo. Hello. How you doing? Hi, how are you? Do you mind showing me around the, uh, the Muti market? Uh, yeah, as I'm talking to these people because I'm seeing some herbs which are very important here. It's, it's used for, to, pre, to pre, pre, prevent lightning from striking your, how, your home. Wow. Because witch doctors are, are, are using other herbs to send lightning to you, but if you have got this one, it will not come. And it works? It works. It works. Without these herbs, we wouldn't be living because there are so many witch doctors that want to kill our patients, want to kill ourselves, so we always protect ourselves with these herbs. Clearly there's a battle going on here between good and evil magic. The magic potions create a very powerful medicine. 
but I wanted to understand how this magic works. What are these? These are snakes. No shooting. No shooting. I'm sorry. No shooting. Is there a certain animal that you would use if you were afraid, for instance? Yeah, you can take the, 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 the lion bone because the lion is uh, not afraid of people, so you mix it with your herbs and then you become strong. Sure. Yeah. I've heard that, that sometimes they use human parts as well. No, no. Those are not traditional healers. Right. Those are witch doctors. Right. Traditional healers will only heal but not kill. Uh -huh. Those that use human parts are not among our members. How does it make you feel when people are trading in human parts and killing people, most especially children, it seems? I feel very much offended, and I have spoken to the police. Those are the people that need to be hanged because they kill other people's children. We are totally against that, and we will never condone it. It seems that black and white magic use similar techniques, but to very different ends. I wanted to find out more and ask Dr. Mklongo if there was any way he could teach me. Today in the afternoon, I'll be going to the Sangoma graduation in Mapumolo. Oh. And uh, I wonder if you could come with me because uh, many things will be happening there, things that I've never seen before you'll be seeing there. Sangoma's dancing, you know, drinking herbs and all those things. So a Sangoma is a healer, trained in the use of herbs and magic to protect people against disease and those who would do them harm. This journey's taken me 50 miles outside of Durban into the Zulu heartland. The Sangoma I'm about to visit has been waiting many months to graduate, and the ceremony is planned to last the whole weekend. I've never seen anything like this. I have no idea what to expect. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary mix. I've turned up early, so they're all still getting ready. Um, and it's so cool. But I feel like a bit of a sort of a... An interloper at the moment. Well, so I should really. Kind of the odd one out. I was lucky enough to find a guide to explain to me what was going on. They're going to come out with a with a student here from the, from this from this hut here, yeah. and going to sit here and to, do the plating. Animals play a big part in the ceremony. If the chicken flies from the Sangoma's head, then the Sangoma won't be able to graduate. But then, looking into the hut, I caught a glimpse of something I found really hard to take. The first of what was to be many animal sacrifices. I was feeling increasingly uncomfortable. But it seemed that the Sangomas felt the sacrifices were part of the power of the magic. The goat that I'd heard scream only a few minutes before now had a further role to play in increasing the Sangomas' witchcraft. Why are they cutting the, uh, the lamb skin, uh, the goat skin? Oh, oh the skin, uh, I think they are, they, are, they are making the, the bangles. The graduator will, will have these uh, bangles here and a close over here. They have got a belief that the ancestors sit here. The seat of the ancestors is at the shoulders. And so whenever she, she, someone comes to prophesy, she takes it and she puts it over so that they find them at the, the closest, ah. closest, not far away. <laughs> Excellent. The ceremonies depicting death and rebirth also include elements of physical ordeal. 
Here the Sangoma has to drink the bile of the sacrificed goat. But this is also a party. After all, the Sangoma has spent a year learning her trade. And the traditional beer also plays an important role. I left them for the rest of the night to celebrate, whilst I tried to take in what I'd seen, and to be honest, to shake some of it off. I don't know what to, 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 to make of yesterday. I found it difficult to watch. I had to turn away a couple of times with the, uh, the animals being slaughtered. And I respect them for the fact that it's part of the ceremony, it's part of what they do, and the animals are going to be eaten. Let's not put too fine a point on it. I might bring it up today and just, and just ask about it, whether the animals have to suffer or whether uh, it could be done I don't know, more humanely. Watching the ceremony, I was concerned about the animals. Is the pain and the suffering that they seem to go through, is that important for the ceremony? Do they have to make a noise? The, the, the noise that is made by the animal is a trumpet that uh, is, is blown to the ancestors so that they understand, they, they listen, to, they take heed. We believe that some of the ancestors are asleep. So when, when the trumpet cries, see, everybody wakes up and listens. So if the animal was killed and remained silent, it wouldn't be as powerful? The whole thing would be, be a flop. By the river, the Sangoma was undergoing a purification ceremony. I wanted to take this chance to ask her directly about her powers as a witch. Now that you've had the, the, the ceremony and you've graduated, what are the, the, the nature of the powers that you have? Where do they come from? <laughs> Would you have to protect anybody from um, someone trying to do evil to them? Even from another, another witch doctor? Yes, yes. Thank you, and uh, I think we, uh, I think you'll need it. Thank you. Throughout the graduation, uh, people have talked about the ancestors. Why are they so important? You know, other people know God. But we, as Africans, know Umveli Ngangi. We do not talk to Umveli Ngangi direct or to God direct. We talk to our ancestors, and our ancestors will talk to God or Umveli Ngangi on our behalf. When times are hard, do people turn to the bad side if they feel that the good side isn't delivering what they need? Some people are bewitching up other people to get what they have. If you have got a beautiful car, some people will just hate you for that and kill you for that. And some are unemployed, they would like to be employed where you are working, so they kill you for that. So the witches are also getting more patience. The Sangoma has graduated, and I must admit it was a remarkable experience for me. Although a lasting image will always be the fear in the animal's eyes before they died. Apparently, their pain and suffering increases the magic, and that appears to be a, a, an underlying part of the process. So, I'm going to go back and see Dr. Yonker. See where that takes me. From my journey so far, I've begun to see that there must be parallels between how the Sangoma and the witch doctors create their powerful magic. 
Dr. Juncker has first-hand experience of the dark side, and I needed to find out more. Many Sangomas, after they've been arrested for, for serious crimes, that they said that they lost their powers, their medicine doesn't work good anymore, and now they have to go to the other side, to the darker side, and that's where they use, start to use uh, human remains. There are specific uses for different parts of the body? Yes, they have specific uses. The tongue, they use that for, for you to speak much fluently in your own language. Virility, uh, of course, um, there are certain parts of, of, of uh, the woman's vagina that they use. Um, the eyes for better sight. OK, great. I've got a voodoo doll here as well with a needle still in it. Oh. And uh, on many occasions, you will be also be finding that some of the fat that's been used are also human fat. Oh. And so it's very gory, uh, most of the stuff. So if these the... things do work. And the medicine is stronger if they're using... The human parts. Human parts and well, children's the, parts. Yeah, children, especially children's parts. They, they believe that. They believe what the ancestors are telling me. Dr. Juncker then showed me the scale of evil witchcraft that's performed in South Africa. Estimates put it at roughly one mooty murder a day. Each of these files represents yet another case of a witchcraft murder. And the parallel with the practices of the good witches became clear. The more excruciating the pain, and the more noise the victim makes, the greater the chance of waking the ancestors, the more powerful the magic. The victims of these murders are innocent children who are caught up in a world of superstition and plain evil. Young Adam, the boy in the Thames, has never been identified. He was killed as part of a ritual sacrifice, a case of witchcraft murder that was eventually tracked down to Nigeria. But who are the people who ask for the spells to be performed when they know children will suffer? And how can it be fought? I'm here to talk to Gerard Labuskakni, a police psychologist at the front line of the fight against African witchcraft. How do you fight occult-related crime? The difficulty in fighting it are, are multifaceted. You've got, obviously, the belief system. If, as long as people believe in this, they will always, perhaps you can say, be a market for it. We find that a lot of our criminals are starting to make use of, of Muti to, to help them in their criminal activities. We find, for example, bank robbers arrest these people on the scene they are wearing Muti, and when you question them about it, they will tell you that they got that to, for example, pre prevent them from being shot or to prevent them from being arrested. Most people would believe that um, herbs or in extreme animal parts can be used to create some kind of advantage for a person. Just the extreme furthest part away from that is the belief that human body parts could be the most powerful ingredients. Do you believe in the powers that these people claim they have? What I believe isn't relevant, because what I have to work with is the people out there who do believe it's going to work, because they are the ones that are going to commit the next one and the next one. So I often compare it to uh, someone hearing voices. I know it's not true, but to them it's true, and they're going to react to those voices, and that's what's important, to understand their frame of reference, because that's what you have to work with when you're trying to solve these particular kind of crimes. The people murdered to create the powerful magic aren't the only innocent victims of witchcraft. In its search for the culprits in a Muti murder, as in Europe 300 years ago, it doesn't take long for the mob to turn on any unpopular person. This recent news report is from the north of South Africa. A traditional healer has been accused by his community of murdering a young boy. animals. The police regularly deal with lynch mobs who enact their own justice on those they feel are responsible for their ills. The witch hunts of today in Africa and those that took place here in Scotland 300 years ago seem like a long, long way away, in place and in time. For us in the modern Western world, witches are no longer a part of our lives, or so we might think. But it only takes something unspeakable, inexplicable to happen for us to rekindle our belief in witchcraft. When any gruesome murder or horrific act against a child is uncovered, even now, many people still attribute it to the evils of Satanism or witchcraft. 
Throughout history, witches have been figures of fear. Many innocent people have become victims of irrational superstition. Outsiders falsely accused of doing the devil's work. In fact, many witches are just practitioners of alternative medicines and religion. What I wasn't expecting to find was that now, today, there are some witches who really are doing the devil's work. In some parts of the world, the belief in witchcraft has so corrupted men's minds that hundreds of people, many of them children, are dying in a pursuit of a myth of magic. It's a troubling reminder that our darkest thoughts lie just under the surface and it can take very little for true horror to emerge.